Hello, my name is Lily Whittacombe and I'm a curator here at the National Museum of Australia. A big welcome to our online and on-site audience who are joining us here today. We are delighted to see you for another episode of Live at the Museum, in which we're bringing the museum to you, in your homes, your schools, or wherever you may be around the world. Now we begin as always with an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge that we're meeting here today on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal, the Noonawal and the Ngambri peoples. I pay my deepest respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be here with us today or who are watching this live stream. Now today's program connects with our latest exhibition, Endeavour Voyage, the untold stories of Cook and the first Australians. And in 1770, the crew on the Endeavour ship and the first peoples on the shore are all living beneath the same night sky. But what they're seeing are quite different things. And with us to look at these two different perspectives are two superstars from the Australian world of astrophysics. We have Peter Swanton, a Gamilaroi man originally from Mackay in Queensland, and Dr Brad Tucker, originally from Sacramento in California. Now both Pete and Brad are working now in astrophysics at the Australian National University and they're really familiar figures with us all through their radio, TV and public program work. Now the way today is going to work is I'm going to be asking Pete and Brad a series of questions and we're then going to throw the questions open to you, to the audience online. So if you're watching this at home or at school, please write any questions you have in the comment thread and I'm going to ask these a bit later on in the program. Now, for any visitors who are watching this and are living nearby, please be assured the National Museum of Australia is open and welcoming to visitors on site. We're following all health guidelines and the safety of our visitors is always our first priority. Now, for those of you who are unable to visit the museum in person, we've created a short video which is going to help you feel as though you're here with us at the museum in the exhibition and especially in the Sky Stories module. And it's also going to introduce you a bit more to Pete and Brad. So we'll play this now. Gugunga winning Elena, Maringa and Yurale winning Elena. We're standing here today on the lands of Ngunnawal and Nambri people. I acknowledge the elders, I acknowledge the ancestors, and I acknowledge the people of this land. My name's Peter Swanton, I'm a Gamilaroi man, and I'm also an astronomer at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the Australian National University here in Canberra. really uh, interesting time to be in, in Indigenous astronomy at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of research happening uh, right now which is looking to link these star stories with modern sort of Western astronomy, uh, things around like moon halos and, and planetary positions and sort of tracking things across the sky and how those link with, with what we now know about astronomy. One of the big legacies that we sometimes forget about the Endeavour Voyage was actually its contribution to astronomy and science. Hi, I'm Dr. Brad Tucker. I'm an astrophysicist at Mount Strum Observatory here in Canberra. The transit of Venus was one of the big missions of the Endeavour Voyage. By observing the exact moment Venus moved across the face of the sun, and by doing it multiple points around the world, they can use trigonometry, yes, that thing you supposedly learned in school, to measure the accurate distance to the sun. You can actually even use the same technique at home. Firstly, you just hold out your finger and blink your eye. Now your finger is gonna move differently between the positions of your eyes. Now imagine instead of your eyes, you have telescopes all around the world. That is the same technique Endeavour and astronomers use to measure the distance to the sun. And the transit of Venus wasn't a one-off phenomenon. This is actually something Australians saw in 2012. Uh, and even still today, it's using as a test of general relativity, Einstein's laws of gravity, and even still precision measurements of the sun. So for Aboriginal people, Venus was generally considered the, either the morning star or the evening star. Stars in indigenous culture portray different things um, depending on, on what the object is. So when you've got the emu in the sky, that star story uh, very much revolves around a calendar 
and sort of using what we can see in the sky to inform us of what is happening down here on Earth. Unlike things like the emu in the sky, uh, Venus was more of a, a social indicator for a lot of people, so there was a lot of ceremonies around it, uh, especially around that time when it would turn from the morning star into the evening star, which would happen uh, around every 600 days or so. The Endeavour mission has a long history in astronomy. Things from the Space Shuttle Endeavour to even the new SpaceX Dragon capsule is called Endeavour, partially because of that legacy. We've had topography of the Moon and Mars all called to it. Astronomers like the connection and history of astronomical and science experiments, and sometimes don't appreciate the full story that a Denver is and a Denver means to all of the people that encountered it. But yet to astronomers, it is part of the history of scientific exploration and astronomical exploration. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Now we're gonna open up to question time and I'm gonna lead in by asking a few questions. Now, my first question is for you, Pete. So could you explain the way that the First Peoples of Australia used astronomy in their everyday lives? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Aboriginal people had a very pragmatic approach to astronomy. Uh, so they would use astronomy for different ways, such as navigation, uh, calendars or for informing sort of social or ceremonial practices. Uh, the classic example of a calendar is the emu in the sky story. Um, and then one that we will go on to talk a little bit about later is Venus, which is very much used in more of a, a social or ceremonial aspect. Yeah, great. Thank you. Look, my next question is for you, Brad. Mm -hmm. So in 1769, the Endeavour is heading to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus. So we now know this as the first great international space collaboration. Could you explain firstly why it was important to observe the transit of Venus? And secondly, what did it contribute to modern day astronomy? So, so firstly, just a point of correction here. You said I'm a superstar. I'm actually an exploding <laughs> star. There is a difference. <laughs> I do things that blow up. So anyways, um, it was great. It was the transit of Venus was this big first global astronomical science experiment. It was trying to build and do a really big goal, and that was measuring how far away the sun is. A very fundamental question, one that people have been asking for thousands of years, one that we even still try and measure and perfect that measurement today. And so what was happening is they knew that Venus was going to go in front of the sun all across the world, or a large part of it. So it's kind of like if I just move my hand and eclipse my face. So what they were doing is they said, all right, if we set up telescopes all around the world, we can observe at multiple points and see this event occurring. So they were actually using this thing called trigonometry. Yes, kids, we do use trigonometry. I actually have used it this week. Don't count on that though. So um, it's this really great way of using mass to measure a very fundamental thing, and that is the distance to the sun. But the key is having a big enough area around the world to see it, and that was the goal of this ex expedition and the goal of this project was how far away is the sun? Oh, that's fascinating. Look, while we're looking at the planet Venus, mm. what's the role and significance of Venus in Aboriginal astronomy, Pete? Yeah, so in um, sort of Uwaliai traditions, it is uh, very much a, a social or a ceremonial signifier. Uh, so it's quite often referred to as the morning star or the evening star um, and it's the first sort of story comes back to uh, what we call Malian, who is sort of the great eagle hawk. And so at night, uh, Malian's eyes are actually Venus and Mars. And so the Uwalaroi people would meet with the Arenti people in, um, from Queensland. And so they would bring a sort of green blue opal from uh, Gamilaroi territory. And then the Arenti people would bring a red opal. And so these would signify the eyes of Malian, and that would be sort of a coming together of mm. Venus and Mars here on Earth. Because there's this sort of common story in um, Aboriginal culture, which uh, everything that's in the sky is actually reflected here on Earth. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of a, a significant story. Well, and it's cool, because you were just saying it's the morning and evening star, and that's yeah. something that we still use today, right? I mean, right now it's the morning star, yeah. Venus, yeah. right? It's rising about 4 a.m., you can go out and see it. And so it's a great thing that it's still the still same tradition and story and meaning that 
you can go out and do tomorrow morning. Yep. That's the amazing thing about it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fascinating. And now, Brad, I have a question for you. Now, the Endeavour Voyage has been hugely influential in naming places in Australia and beyond, to the extent that there's craters on Mars, lakes on the moon, which are named after the Endeavour Voyage. Why do you think it is that Endeavour has been so influential in the naming of space geography? You know, so I think one thing Pete and I can probably agree with is astronomers are terrible at naming things. We are not creative. Uh, we call it like we see it. But we also get stuck a bit of, in history and legacy. And when we were just talking about Endeavour and how it was part of this big, one of the earliest astronomical experiments in the world, we like just to continue that naming thing. Endeavour then inspired some of the Apollo capsules or equipment to be named Endeavour. So that then uh, inspired one of the space shuttles to be called Endeavour. So that then inspired mm -hmm. the SpaceX Crew Dragon that just came back with two people to be called Endeavour. Because it's, it's trying to pay homage to the history of our field. But I think what's important, and it, it struck me when I went through the exhibit, was I wonder what would happen if we understood what the full meaning of Endeavour meant to everyone who encountered it. We, we think that we're, we're trying, I think, maybe to do a good thing and paying homage to this mm. important thing in our field, but we don't realize what it meant to everyone who encountered that. And could we find a way of carrying that tradition, but in a better, more inclusive manner? Pete, do you want to add anything to this? Like, do you think it's changing in any way? Yeah, it absolutely is changing. Um, so we just had a recent announcement from NASA that they are sort of re-looking at some of the, the um, sort of more colloquial names for, for some of the galaxies and stuff like that. And just this week myself, I got approached by a group uh, that sort of had a, a collaboration between a Colorado observatory and an observatory here in Australia, Siding Spring Observatory up in Coonabarra Brand. Uh, about sort of naming a, a really cool binary asteroid system, one after the, the native people in Colorado and one uh, in, in a sort of Gamilaroi name after the people around here. Yeah, wow. So things really are changing. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, look, this is my last question before I'm going to open to the live stream comments. Pete, this is for you. How does Indigenous astronomy intersect with modern day research? Yeah, um, yeah it's absolutely uh, sort of a really interesting topic. Um, so some of the ways in which they, they looked at the stars, so uh, they, they talked about star scintillation, which is how the, the stars sort of twinkle, I guess. And so all of that twinkling has to do with how the, the atmosphere itself is changing. And we know that the, the way in which the atmosphere behaves affects the weather. Mm. And so they were able to use this star scintillation and what, what it was actually doing to the stars to actually inform the weather. Another really cool one, and Brad, you'll know about this, is about variable stars. Mm. Variable stars in modern astronomy is very much a, a young field. It's, it's a very much an evolving field, whereas there are stories in, in Aboriginal culture around the variability of stars like Betelgeuse and Antares, um, and we even know like Betelgeuse mm. just this year has, has been a, a hot topic of talk because it's sort of dimmed and people are like, oh, is it going to explode and stuff like that? And so yeah. there's this real sort of um, interconnection between them, yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. All right, now for our online audience who's been waiting with bated breath, now is the time that we're going to ask your questions. So we have one, first of all, from Julianne. Are there any stories or physical evidence of tracking the phases of the moon in Indigenous astronomy? So, Pete, this one's for you. Cool. Uh, yeah, this is a, a really good question. And so the, um, I guess the sort of main uh, like common theme in Aboriginal astronomy is that the sun is a woman and the moon is a man. And the, the moon man, he's generally not a nice person. He's usually greedy or mischievous or something like that. And so there is a story around the sort of phases of the moon and sort of when, so when he's a full moon, he's like, he's really fat and he's, he's sort of been really gluttonous and, um, and his wives don't like that. And so they sort of chop pieces away from him. And so that's sort of, as you see the moon sort of going away, and then he actually fades away to nothing. Um, and then he sort of, sort of is able to, to regenerate himself and sort of sustain himself again. And so that's when he comes back to being full, but then he overdoes it again and becomes a full moon. And so it's, it's this, this cycle of, of sort of gluttony and, and stuff that, that revolves around this mysterious moon man, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, now we have a question here from John. So what do you think the difference is between Western and Indigenous astronomy? 
I, I would say one thing, at least from the Aboriginal astronomy perspective, is the view you have of the sky, right? You know, for instance, one of the great things we have here in the southern skies is what we call the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud. These are two neighboring galaxies that we can see with our own eyes. And you can see them on a dark night like tonight. Look towards south. Now, this is called large because one's large, one's small. They look like clouds. I told you we're not good at this naming thing. And Magellan appeared to discover it. But clearly, anyone who lived in the southern hemisphere the entire previous 100,000 years, 200,000 years, would have seen these things. So to them, it was this amazing thing and a new discovery. But in traditions in the southern hemisphere, both in Australia and South America and Africa, the Magellanic clouds are, are part of their story and their astronomy and their knowledge way before Western astronomy. And so it's, it's almost like a, a time scale, a time difference. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, um, and I feel like um, the real sort of, I guess, interesting part about this, this sort of intersection is that it's not like you know Western astronomy is superior or, or Indigenous astronomy is superior. They they are very much two knowledge systems um, that are separate but also significant in their own in their own right. And so exploring those intersections, like when we're talking about variable stars and and weather patterns and stuff like that, is where you really sort of get to the sort of um, bare bones of science and and sort of what what observe, what it means to actually observe something. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, look, I've got a question now from Isabel in Queensland. Isabel's eight years old, so welcome, Isabel. And she'd like to know, what is the emu in the sky story? So I might throw that one to you, Pete. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the emu in the sky is uh, basically a way in which um, Aboriginal people would use the Milky Way uh, as a calendar. Um, and so if, you, if you're lucky enough to, to live nearby a dark sky, it's actually a really great time of year. The Milky Way is out very early. It's really easy to see. Um, so sort of early in the year, uh, you'll actually see the entire Milky Way sort of stretched across the sky. And this actually looks like an emu running. And so at that point, that sort of signifies the female emu is chasing the male emu. So we know that it's breeding season. That's when we know we can go out to the emu nest, we can um, hunt the eggs for food and do all of that. And then sort of later on in the year, the, the emu will shift around in the sky and you can no longer see the, the legs anymore. So that signifies the male emu uh, sort of sitting on the nest and is incubating the eggs. So this is when we know, okay, we need to stop going and hunting these things because we want the, the species to survive for, for next season and then and then it'll sort of keep rotating around again, and you can only see the body of the emu now. So that signifies the emu with its head in the watering hole. So that's when we know, okay, the local watering holes are full. We can go there, we can collect our water and do what we need for that. Mm. And then later on in the year, you can no longer see the emu at all. That signifies that the emus have left the watering hole. There's no more water, we're in, we're in the dry season now. And then that sort of repeats. So that's sort of using the, the Milky Way, the emu in the sky, again, to inform us what is happening here on Earth. Yeah, wow. Thank you. Now, we have a question here from Cynthia, which is, why is it important for Australians to understand Aboriginal astronomy? It's a really great question. Yeah. Uh, Brad, do you want to lead in? So, yeah, and I, ha and I have two answers to this question. I think, Cynthia, this is a great question. I think, one, if we don't learn about it scientifically, our knowledge is in incomplete. You know, we talk about an understanding how things in astronomy and space change. We have now a longer baseline. We have more area. We have more information. We have more knowledge to discover. You know, in my field, exploding stars, one of the first supernova discovered was by Chinese astronomers over a thousand years ago. And that has led to modern day scientific discoveries using the world and space observatories just to follow this observation because we said, hey, We've been observing things for 50 years, or we've been observing things for 65,000 years. I'll choose 65,000 years every time. The second point, though, I would say is we want to know about our place in the universe, why we're here, where we're going, what we're doing, what people in the future will do, what people in the past have done. And, and, and we, we need to learn from that. I think we often view science as this thing we're doing now, but science is built up on the knowledge from the past. That's what it's all about. So we're just ignoring a huge part of our scientific knowledge if we just don't learn about it. Pete? 
Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And um, yeah, like like um, like we spoke about before, like these are uh, different knowledge systems. And like you touched on yeah. there, uh, if you ignore one or the other, you don't have the full picture. Yeah. Um, and science itself is is never stagnant. It's always about more information. More is always better. The more, more is better. The That's more right. we know, um, the more the the better idea we've got of the full picture. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, now we have a question here from Michael. So, how did early Australians interpret the significance of solar eclipses? Pete, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. Um, is, um, I actually just wrote an article on this, actually, which is uh, going to come out in a in a uh, astronomy guide next year. Um, and so the the solar eclipse was again it was a very significant um, event, uh, and they actually somewhat were able to predict them. Um, there is, there is evidence of of some communities that that would know when eclipses were going to come within you know sort of sort of a certain time frame. Mm -hmm. um, you know, much uh, like we, we've obviously got that that ability to do that now, but but to be able to significantly do that is is incredible. And a lot of the stories again are, revolve around ceremonial practice um, because it's not it's not a, a regular event. It's irregular. It, it doesn't sort of it's not able to base a calendar off it or something like that. Mm. Um, and a lot of it is around. Uh, it's generally a bad omen. Uh, so if, if there's a solar eclipse happening, that meant that, you know, it could mean that, that's, that a relative or, or someone that uh, had an important adventure and had actually died on the adventure or something like that, or, or that, you know, if, if you weren't um, sort of following social protocols that, you know, you might um, bring uh, sort of shame or, or something bad onto your community. And so you would often have ceremonies that would sort of Sort of cleanse the bad omens and the bad spirits away, and and so it was very much a ceremonial sort of um, sort of time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Okay, we have a question here from Suma. What degree did Pete do? Was Aboriginal astronomy taught at uni? Yeah, very good question. Um, so I did a Bachelor of Science uh, at the Australian National University here in Canberra. Uh, as part of that, I majored in physics and specialised in astronomy and astrophysics. Unfortunately, uh, Aboriginal astronomy wasn't taught as part of my program, uh, although hopefully uh, in the next couple of years we can rectify that. I know there is plans um, at other universities and even um, some, some early talks at the Australian National University of, of actually sort of collaborating and sort of collecting all of this information mm. and sort of presenting it. And I really think it is important, not, not only for, for astronomy students, but also for you know, your Indigenous studies and, and everyone. I really mm. think it is, it's so fundamental that it should be uh, offered at, at least as an elective in any degree that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Brad, what did you study to become an astrophysicist? Uh, so I did um, physics, philosophy and theology as an undergraduate. And it's actually, I think, as, as on what elements Pete touched on, by understanding those different knowledge systems, you become more well-rounded. Um, and then I went on to do my PhD in astrophysics, and then I get to work with great students. So Pete and I get to do fun things with black holes. Um, and you know, just back to that question, though, I, I do think, as Pete said, we need to formally engage with this. I think part of the problem, and it's not an, an excuse; it's the reality, is we're just keeping, we're just catching up. Right, you know, it's like it's a 65,000 year marathon that we started only 10 years ago. Um, and so there's a lot to catch up on, which means there's a lot of wealth and richness that we can start exploring and teaching. As you said, our, our science students, engineering students, you know, cultural students, anthropology, you, you name it, of, of all the reasons you said of how critical it was part of society. Um, and I think that's one of the great things that, you know, hopefully Pete and I can work together on and seeing actually happen. Yeah. Absolutely, that'll be fantastic. Okay, now we have a question here from Felix. Hello, Felix, it's seven years old. And Felix wants to know, how far can a telescope see? So I might throw this one to Brad. Yeah. Uh, great question. So telescopes are just giant light buckets. So if your eye was the size of a telescope, you would see the same thing. You would look weird, but you would also see the same thing. So if your eye is like this, you will see the same thing. Now, the biggest telescope we have currently on the world is 10 meters across. So it's, it's not even 
it's wider than my arms. Currently, the ANU where we work is building a telescope that's gonna be 25 meters across. So literally, 25 meters from side to side is the size of the mirror. We hope to be able to see light that is billions and billions of light years away. Now, using different techniques and different colors, the oldest or furthest we've ever seen is what we call the cosmic microwave background. This is like the, the relic light. It's the residual leftover bits of the Big Bang. And that occurred about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So we've seen over 13 and a half billion years back into the universe using some really big telescopes. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have another seven-year-old who's asked a question. This time it's from Bo. So hello, Bo. How do we find Venus in the sky at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, Pete, do you want to answer this yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Venus, uh, so it's known, it's currently now the evening star. Uh, which means morning that you're star. sorry it's the morning star yeah, we just had the yeah, evening yeah, star yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry it's it's the morning star at the moment which means that you're going to need to be up very early right. in order to be able to see it because you're going to want to be up sort of just before sunrise is when you're going to be able to see it the good news is is that venus is actually the third brightest object in the sky so it's quite easy super to spot. bright yep. uh, obviously the sun is the brightest uh, and then the moon is next and then venus is actually the yeah. third brightest one so all you need to do is sort of um, go out very early in the morning just before sunrise and sort of look very similar in the direction where the sun is going to come up and you should see a very bright uh, sort of disc in the sky and that will be Venus. Hard to miss as long as yeah. it's clear. Yes. <laughs> Okay, look, we're coming to the end of our program now, but we do have time for a few more questions. Be reassured, if we don't actually get time to answer your question in the live stream, we will be responding to it in the public comments below. Now, I'm going to return to another question. This is from Ms. Poetry. Peter, in your work, do you have issues with access to significant sky stories, such as women-only stories um, or levels of initiation? Uh, it absolutely can be a barrier, um, particularly in, in sort of more... Uh, I guess academic research papers and stuff like that. So, a lot of the the stuff that I talk about actually is it excludes a lot of that sensitive information um, purely because of like there there are things around you know women's business. Um, there are things around cultural sensitivities and and there's there's almost I guess there's an unwillingness for communities to actually share sensitive information with. Um, academics right because mm. we've had this 250 years where we haven't been treated well and so there, there's a reluctance and and e there's even a problem in academia and Brad yeah. would know about that that yeah. um, the, the conversion rate for PhDs is actually quite low yeah. and so you can imagine you're sharing sensitive information with someone that may not even ever actually publish the work that you're mm. like the stuff that you're telling them about and that's a really hard thing to make mm. and the other problem we have is that our older people our older generation aren't getting any younger mm. and so they are now in this impossible position where they have to make the decision between do we share this with someone that we don't traditionally share it with or do we let this information die with us and it's it's not an easy question no. um, and, and, but it's, it's a reality of, of these knowledge systems and, mm. and it's an important hurdle that we need to address. Yeah, of course. That was an excellent question. Now, this is a question here from Pinky. Why did you both decide to become astronomers? Mm. Why, yeah, why you Pete, go first, you Pete? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, um, I started my degree at James Cook University in Townsville, which is, I guess, uh, fitting given the, the topic of the day um, and my first year physics teacher up there was uh, John Dacopoulos. Uh He was doing his master's in astronomy at the time and I just I really had a connection with him and his teaching style. He was very responsive and, and sort of just, just got me just hooked on physics. Um, and so because he was an astronomer I'm like okay well maybe I want to be an astronomer. So I sort of looked up the best place in Australia to do astronomy. That's the Australian National University. So I applied to ANU and, and yeah. I came here to do that, yeah. Fantastic. I'm going to ask you, Brad, but I will jump in and say that you have revealed to me before that your childhood dream was in fact to be a garbage truck. <laughs> the, the actual truck, not the driver, <laughs> keep in mind. You're told you can be anything you want. It's a lie. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, I, I didn't, I, look, I didn't really want to be an astronomer. I mean, 
kind of like Pete, I slightly fell into it later. I, um, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, I eventually went to university. Um, you know, I said, hey, physics sounds fun. Started studying physics. I said, hey, philosophy sounds fun. Sure, why not? And then I was like, all right, I want to do some research, um, you know, just as Pete and I got to work together on. And I emailed a few people, and I emailed some people in the department, and the astronomer, astronomy professor replied first. And here I am today. And, and I think that's kind of the, the great thing. You know, some people, you may, you kids, you may know you love astronomy. That's great. Follow that passion. If you don't know or you change your mind, it, it's OK, because we both change our minds. It happens. You don't have to know what you're doing at 7. You don't have to know what you're doing at 20, for the most part. Yeah, yeah absolutely. OK, now we have a question here from Catalina. So she's asking, do you have key examples of how astronomy is linked to indigenous agricultural practices and cultural fire? That's a, an excellent question, quite challenging, I think. Pete, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, um, so the, I guess the, the obvious one that we just spoke about was the emu in the sky story. So that's, that's around, I guess, using it to inform what happens here on Earth. Yeah. Um, there, there are sort of um, other stories about, I guess, natural processes. Um, not none that I can think of that that actually link to, um, I guess, where like the I'm I'm guessing the cultural fires is sort of the the cultural practice of burning mm. or something like that. Um, one of my my favourite stories, which again actually links back to Venus and Mars and and this idea of Malian the great eagle hawk is is the, the, the fire ceremony. Uh, so when Venus actually first appears as the evening star, um, the, they will light a fire that evening. And so that fire is ceremonial lit every evening until um, Venus appears as the morning star, which initially seems strange because Venus can't be the evening and the morning star at the same mm. time. But in this case, Mars is actually the morning star. And so again, that's we're coming back to linking Venus and Mars, and, and the idea of, of those being Malian's eyes and, and Malian sort of being the, the overlooker of the of the people. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Here we have a question from Jennifer. This is a great question. So she's asking, where can we get more resources on astronomy? So I mean, uh, if you search for. Mount Trum Observatory, the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics. We have lots of websites, uh, lots of information, lots of videos. We've done recordings aimed at uh, children in school, through adults, um, videos and recordings and some of the, the photos and videos and, and information that we've taken with our telescopes or that sort of thing. NASA maintains a pretty good site for astronomy. They have an, even a whole section on education and for kids. Um, but there's also an, an entire other place dedicated uh, to Aboriginal astronomy, right, Pete? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you can go to aboriginalastronomy.com.au. Uh, it's a website where you'll, you'll see a profile of me. Uh, there's also a, a whole bunch of other great um, um, Aboriginal astronomers on there. Um, you, can you can actually find a lot of them on Twitter. Uh, so Aboriginal Astro on Twitter. Um, and yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of people uh, out there that, that are great resources for, for Aboriginal astronomy in particular. Yeah, great. Look, I'm afraid that that's our last question from the audience today. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today, especially those of you who asked a question. I know there, were, there was a really big audience today and a lot of you were school children, so maybe this has inspired some of you to go on and study astrophysics and perhaps you might be doing something similar one day. So if we haven't been able to answer your questions, just remember that we will answer it in the public comments in the live stream. So just keep an eye on that. Now, I'm going to end with one final question. This is to both Pete and Brad. This is really a burning question that I've had for a long time. I'm just going to set the scene. It's midwinter, it's Canberra, and it's absolutely freezing. Why do astrophysicists in Canberra always wear shorts and thongs, even in winter? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. Like for me, it's a it's a comfort thing. Uh, so I come from North Queensland, where it's just hot all year round. Um, so coming to Canberra, where you can actually walk outside and just not be sweating and and sort of hot, I just I just embrace that and, and sort of really enjoy the the cool weather. 
Well, I'm an astronomer, right? So if time is relative, temperature is relative. So what does it matter? Um, you know, it's all fine. But can I just hijack something real quick? If you're in the ACT and surrounds or in one of the many communities in Northern Territory, next week, satellite selfie, check it out. You can go outside and take a selfie literally from space. Pete and I will both be in it, as well as the fabulous NMA and lots of other things. Check it out. I'm done. Well, thank you so much, Pete and Brad, for joining us here today. You've really helped to animate the Sky Story modules in our latest exhibition, Endeavour Voyage, The Untold Stories of Cook and the First Australians. Now, live at the museum is now going to be shown fortnightly. We're going to leave you with a preview of our next program, which is a virtual garden forecourt tour. This is number two with Adam Ship, a Wiradjuri man from Yorbe. So join the conversation on YouTube next Thursday, sorry, the following Thursday, 27th of August at 12.30pm. Thank you. Hello.